So greetings, everybody, and thank you all for join us, us, joining us this evening for our second uh, lecture in our lecture series um, on the synod on, on synodality, on becoming a more synodal church, um, and how the role of women plays into that. So we're very excited to host this evening's lecture series. And I would like to introduce our interim president, Father Justin Daffrin, interim president of Loyola. He's going to be giving our welcome this evening. So thank you, Father Justin, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Tracy, for the opportunity, and good evening, friends. It's wonderful to be able to gather as a Loyola community, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the university this evening. First, allow me to express my thanks to Dr. Susan Bigelow Reynolds and our alumni responder, Kayla August, uh, for your willingness to uh, share your insights and open up this conversation uh, this evening on the role of women in the church. And to Tracy and colleagues in LIM for putting together this important series that allows us to reflect on uh, the Synod. And to everyone who's joining this evening uh, for your taking time uh, to engage with the series uh, and to enjoy us, to join us. The dialogue and conversation this evening is core to the mission of a Jesuit Catholic university. It has been said that it is within the Catholic university that the church does her most important thinking. And we know we need critical thinking regarding the role of women in the church. My own views largely have been shaped by my theological studies in Berkeley, California. It was a class of 20, that were studying for the MDiv degree. And within that class of 20, half were women. It was from their commitment to ministry, leadership, love for the church, and witness to the gospels that I began to develop greater sensitivities and to listen more intently myself around the role of women in the church and deepen my own hope for greater inclusivity for women in all aspects of ministry. It has been wonderful to see how their careers, I shouldn't say the word careers because that's the wrong word, their ministries and service to the church has flourished over the last 20 years. True blessings in the sharing of their gifts and talents. We know that women continue to be some of the church's greatest innovators, prophets, leaders, and preachers, despite institutional barriers. We rest upon the courageous legacies of the women who have gone before and look forward with hope to a future that advances the role of women in the church. Again, thank you on behalf of Loyola University, New Orleans, for joining in this important opportunity to listen and learn from one another this evening. May God bless our evening together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Daffron. And I would like to begin this evening by introducing our first speaker. Dr. Susan Bigelow Reynolds is an assistant professor of Catholic studies at Emory University's Candler School of Theology in Atlanta, Georgia. She is the author of People Get Ready, Ritual, Solidarity, and Lived Ecclesiology in Catholic Roxbury from Fordham University Press, and is a contributing writer on religion and public life for Commonweal Magazine. Her re research focuses on ecclesiology and Catholic practice, with an emphasis on urban parish contexts. She is at work on her second book, An Ethnographic Study of Community Stations of the Cross, which is supported by a grant from the Louisville Institute. She and her husband, Drew, are the parents of three young daughters. So welcome, Susan. I'm so excited that you're here and so grateful that you're here with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Father Daffron. I was so excited um, when I received this invitation um, in part because, <clears throat> excuse me, in part because um, I, I saw it as an invitation first and foremost to deepen my own understanding of what was happening in the Synod. Um, I think that when the Synod first started to unfold, I was in much the same place as everyone else um, in sort of wondering, what is what is this? <laughs> um, and often because of my role, my position, people assumed that I knew 
what was going on. Um, and it became a joke in, in our house between my husband and I that often folks would ask about the synod and we, and I would just say, yeah, you know, journeying together. <laughs> and they would say, what does that mean? And I would say, I will get back to you. Um, but over the past year, um, especially the past year, um, the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to, to dive really deeply into what the church calls synodality. Um, and I've, um, as the Methodists say, I teach at a Methodist institution, as the Methodists say, my heart has been strangely warmed. Um, and so tonight, um, I've been invited to talk about the role of women in the synod and the role of women in the church, sort of in light of the synod. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to do tonight. Um, and I, and Kayla is absolutely magnificent. And I hope that um, between the two of us, we'll be able to spark um, the kind of comments, questions, conversation um, that probably many of you have, have been dying to have. Um, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to begin with a story. Uh, when I was a graduate student in Boston at the School of Theology and Ministry, where Kayla um, is, is currently a student, I lived and ministered at a small Catholic parish that was home to people from many, many cultures. Um, at the bilingual Palm Sunday Mass, instead of reading the lengthy passion narrative that we're all familiar with in a complicated mix of languages, because they would have to do it bilingually, the community traditionally instead performed the story as a 10-minute silent mime. Uh, this silent, expressive performance was set to poignant instrumental music, um, and it offered a way into the story that didn't require missalettes in multiple languages or translations, um, which was, of course, important because so many different people participate in that story. But I was caught off guard when, during my first year at the parish, organizers of the mime assigned me a role in it. Um, I was relatively new to the parish. Uh, and I wasn't expecting to be assigned a role. Um, and I was even more surprised when I learned what that role would be. Uh, I would be playing Jesus. I demurred. I, I didn't want to alienate anyone by stirring up controversy, regardless of how fascinated I guess I was on some level by the idea of reimagining the narrative's gender roles. But I was persuaded when one of the organizers explained that young women at the parish had been portraying Jesus in this mime for a number of years. Uh, it was a way, she said, of acknowledging the crosses that women in the community carried from you know, domestic violence to workplace harassment to the heartaches of motherhood. Um, and I admit that I was also, frankly, um, compelled by the fact that the organizers and choreographers of this ritual were Black and Latino women. I, I think I found myself more willing to accept the role knowing that it wasn't just sort of the simply, sim kind of like the earnest, <laughs> misplaced brainchild of like fellow progressive white women, I guess. Um, but when the organizers announced the MIMES cast at the next parish pastoral council meeting, uh, the pastor, who was a newly assigned uh, diocesan priest who was also quite short-lived in the role, um, who was also managing simultaneously two other parishes at the same time, uh, vetoed the plan. He maintained that uh, the quote-unquote more traditional Spanish mass parishioners would be uncomfortable seeing a woman play the role of Jesus, um, a claim that mine participants from the Spanish mass community rejected. And even if he were right, it seemed clear at the time that he was using concern for Hispanic parishioners to avoid admitting that he was the one who didn't like the idea. He wouldn't be presiding at that mass or actually any of the other Holy Week liturgies at the parish. Um, uh, they, uh, the Jesuits uh, from Boston College served there as well, and they would have been presiding at those liturgies. But regardless, the power was in his hands. On one level, I admit, I was secretly relieved <laughs> to have been released from the burden of the mime's central role. Uh, in a deeper way, though, the decision felt as revealing as it was theologically absurd. I was reassigned to the role of Peter. Apparently, as a woman, I could play the man who cut off somebody's ear and denied Jesus, just not the Savior himself. I tell this story because for me, it marked a theological turning point. 
I was at the time a first year MTS student who had been propelled to grad school because I wanted to think more deeply about the lives and practices of communities on the margins. But I was wrestling at the same time with what it might mean to call myself a feminist theologian, as so many of my friends and colleagues and mentors did. I, I was wondering whether that was a moniker that felt authentic to me, whether that suited me. I'd, I'd never personally felt called to ordination. I had never felt the sting of a vocation denied or deferred, though I'd sympathized with friends who had felt that sting more interiorly. I'd been formed spiritually and intellectually in what I later realized were a succession of deeply conservative Catholic environments. And it was difficult for me to reconcile that affective pull of that formation with my growing intellectual dissatisfaction with the church's reductive view of women's roles. But something about that Palm Sunday mime all the way back in 2000. 12, I think, um, sort of drew back a veil for me. It, it was a deeply practical embodiment of a cascade of really complicated theological questions. What actually made Jesus, Jesus? What about Jesus's humanity was salvific? Was sex the, truly the singular, non-negotiable, essential aspect of Christ's being? What does it mean and what does it require to stand in persona Christi, in the person of Christ? Suddenly, categories that had once seemed so watertight to me felt kind of arbitrary, even a little silly. I also begin with that story because for me, that Palm Sunday in 2012 was an experience of the familiar becoming strange, right? The, the invisible becoming visible to me for the first time. When I teach courses in congregational studies and ecclesial practices, I have my students read Pierre Bourdieu, the late French social theorist. And I explain to them that for Bourdieu, power structures within which we exist are at their most powerful when we don't have to think about them at all when it doesn't even occur to us to think about them. We operate within them by muscle memory, right? Like just like really good athletes or really good musicians have this kind of muscle memory that makes what they do look like second nature, right? They know the rules of the game so well that they couldn't break them if they tried. <laughs> and every choice they make, right? What kind of kick to use, I'm not an athlete, so I'm just guessing here, what play to run, how to improvise on a theme, think of a jazz musician, even choices that seem limitless, right? You could play any note on the piano, right? You could kick the ball in any way you imaginable, are actually quite constrained by these invisible regulations, these norms, right, that, that have a deep hold on us. Change begins when something happens that disrupts that natural frame of reference that makes us stop and think, right? Stop and talk, stop and question about those things that once sort of went without saying. And I want to suggest that this ongoing synod on synodality and, and the working documents and the national synthesis reports that have emerged from it so far marks for the whole church a similar kind of moment, an opportunity to stop to reflect, to look with new eyes, to listen, um, to speak, right? With both personal investment and also critical distance about the practices and norms and theologies and structures that are so familiar to us in the church that they often go without saying. In particular, this evening, I'll invite us to examine the roles of women in the synod and the roles of women in the church in light of the synod. And I'll emphasize how this process of synodal listening has the capacity to cultivate a really profound sense of local, regional, national, and global solidarity for and among women and among lady more broadly. Um, and I'll conclude by inviting us to consider what this means for the present and future of the church and the present and future um, of the parish in particular. So as some of you may have seen, um, and perhaps not, and that's fine too, um, there have been some documents that have come out recently that are sort of synthesis reports of various levels of those initial listening conversations, those listening sessions that have taken place in parishes and communities all around the world. Um, initially, the national syntheses came out, the synthesis documents proper to each country, effectively. Um, and the US has a national synthesis document. And then from there, 
uh, there was a very intense meeting of uh, bishops and theologians for several weeks. And back in October of this past year, uh, the what's called, they called it the DCS, the working document for the, the continental stage of the synod, which is sort of part two, which is coming up, um, uh, came out, was released to the church. Um, and both are extraordinarily unique documents within the context of the church. Right. Everybody picture like your run of the mill encyclical picture going to Vatican.va and pulling it up. And it's on that like hilarious papyrus background. Right. That's what we typically think of when we think of like a, a Vatican or a church document or maybe something on the USCCB website. Right. Typically, church documents subordinate description to normative interpretation. Right. Despite Vatican II's call to scrutinize the signs of the times in light of the gospel. Um, typically, whenever context is invoked or kind of lived experience is invoked in church documents, it's done very much in the service of whatever point is trying to be made. But the national synthesis for the U.S. and the DCS, that document for the, for the next stage, which was a synthesis of all of the national syntheses, um, take a very different approach, right? Privileging description, uh, even when that description lies in contrast to official magisterial teaching. Take the following example from the U.S. national synthesis. I'm going to read a quote here. Uh, they wrote, nearly all synodal consultations shared a deep appreciation for the powerful impact of women religious who have consistently led the way in carrying out the mission of the church. Likewise, there was recognition for the centrality of women's unparalleled co contributions to the life of the church, particularly in local communities. There was a desire for stronger leadership, discernment, and decision-making roles for women, both lay and religious, in their parishes and communities. And here they're quoting from one of the regional synthesis reports. People mentioned, it says, a variety of ways in which women could exercise leadership, including preaching and ordination as deacon or priest. Ordination for women emerged not primarily as a solution to the problem of the priest shortage, but as a matter of justice. That's very powerful. That's very powerful. And a similar sense was echoed globally in the DCS. The call to rethink women's participation, it says, was registered. It said it registered all over the world. The section on women, there are about six paragraphs on the role of women in the church in that document, begins in a really striking way. And I'll read a quote from that. It said, the call for a conversion of the church's culture for the salvation of the world is linked in concrete terms to the possibility of establishing a new culture with new practices and structures. A critical and urgent era area in this regard concerns the role of women and their vocation rooted in our common baptismal dignity to participate fully in the life of the church. The document refers here to the vocation of women in the singular, um, but it's critical to note that this vocation singular in question is not sort of the vocation of motherhood or the vocation of virginity or nurturing or sort of any of the other narrow kind of monolithic stereotypically feminine roles so typically asso assigned to women in papal and magisterial documents. Here, the call to full participation in the life of the church the, the fulfillment of our common baptism, that's the vocation in question. And that's all of our vocations. That's our collective vocation, man, woman, anyone. By locating, and this is even more critical, the need to reconsider women's roles within a deeper and broader call for ecclesial conversion. Remember that section started um, not with women want more of a voice. It started with there's a call for the conversion of the church, for the conversion of the church's culture, for the salvation of the world. By locating the need to reconsider women's roles within that deeper and broader call for ecclesial conversion, the document suggests a sense among the faithful that the, the status quo, the way things are right now, not only represents a problem for women, but it represents a problem for the church's salvific mission to the world. And again, that's very, very important. Conversion always begins in confession. And the DCS's paragraphs on women confess some very uncomfortable truths. Uh, among the most striking to me personally is, is this following excerpt from the Holy Land report. It says, those who were most committed to the synod process were women who seemed to have realized not only that they had more to gain, 
but also more to offer by being relegated to a prophetic edge from which they observe what happens in the life of the church. As I explained in a recent Commonweal article, that line just stunned me the first time I read it, not because it contained a new or radical sentiment, but because it was included in a document of this kind at all. It, it gives the lie, right, to sentimental glorifications of the place that women occupy in the church, right? Women don't offer unique insight because of our feminine genius, right? But because the prophetic edges, as the Holy Land Report states, are the only ground from which we often have to speak. Right? The report from uh, the superiors of Institutes of Consecrated Life uh, is even more stark in many ways in its assessment of the discrimination faced by women religious, right? What was uh, echoed in the U.S. report. They say prevalent sexism in decision-making and church language has led to the exclusion of women from meaningful roles in the life of the church. Uh, it, it indicts the, the treatment of women religious, and this is not only a contemporary problem, this has been a problem for, for centuries, um, as cheap labor, right, and decries the tendency to entrust ecclesial functions to permanent deacons rather than allowing women to share in responsibility for ecclesial communities. Uh, I was recently at a conference in which someone was uh, presenting, uh, his name is John Metz, actually, he's at uh, Marquette, presenting the results of his dissertation research that looked at um, uh, lay, uh, lay pastoral associates who lead parishes. Um, so uh, parishes that are not led by priests, necessarily not, not administered by priests, but administered by a lay person in that role. Um, and uh, the kind of one of the conclusions that he came away with based purely on his observational and really rich um, longitudinal, uh, you know, fieldwork in, in parishes like this was that uh, in order to be the administer, administrator of a parish, you can either be any deacon whatsoever or um, the most overqualified woman on the face of the planet. <laughs> um, and I think that in, in some way, right, that's what that comment is getting at, that uh, the, the tendency, it says, to entrust ecclesial functions to permanent deacons or, or other available men, essentially, rather than allowing women to share in responsibility for ecclesial communities. And as the U.S. report said, it's not about numbers at the end of the day. It's about justice. And it's about the gospel. What's missing from the DCS uh, and from the U.S. national synthesis is consensus um, or even the appearance of consensus. And that's incredibly important. And that's a very good thing. Some people are ardent that women should be ordained to the priesthood. Some people think that women's roles should be expanded and better understood and affirmed outside of the priesthood. Some talked about motherhood. Some talked about the diaconate. And not everybody agrees. And that's fine. And that's great. Right. Often women in the church are treated like a giant monolith, kind of like we talk about, you know, the Latino vote or the Catholic, you know, as though like everybody's thinking the same thing and voting in exactly the same way. Right. It's the same with what, what's up with women in the church. It's like there are literally hundreds of millions of us. So who, which ones are you talking about? Right. We're not a monolith. And of course, there is not agreement. There is not consensus. And nothing would be more suspicious, I think, than the appearance of consensus in documents like these. I do a lot of ethnographic field-based research, and one of the, the governing axioms of that kind of work is that it seems like if everybody thinks the same thing, you're either not asking good enough questions or you're not talking to enough people. The synodal reports refer to this sort of treasury, this anthology of voices reflected in them as representing the census fidei, a term that, that means the, the faith-filled intuition of the people of God. But rather thinking of the census fidei as, as a product, right, a set of like knowable conclusions, it's, I find it more useful to think of it as sort of a verb, right, the, the sensing of the faithful together. What will come out of this sensing uh, and the, the risky acts of honesty that, that came out of it as well is not clear at this point. However, at this stage, I think there's, there's a really important accountability to history that has already come from committing these reports to print. Um, and again, I'll just, I'll emphasize again, these are church documents um, and that's powerful. Um, they, they, they sort of synthesize and I think offer back to the church a, a sense of the insights offered in these listening sessions in this profoundly non-defensive, descriptive, forthright, trusting way. Um, and I think that that sense of trust in the people of God, in the whole people of God, the church, 
um, was why for so many people, including myself, the, the release of them was met with a, a combination of fascination and emotion. I was actually very surprised how uh, emotional I felt when these documents were released. We as laity are not having, not used to having our voices heard and echoed back to us as they are, rather than as they, um, as they should be. Um, and to hear the voices of so many um, offered back to everyone, um, I felt personally was profoundly dignifying. Um, and I'd be curious to hear if others had that experience as well. The last thing I'll, I'll emphasize um, about the documents themselves um, is that both resist in, I think, very admirable ways, the sort of theological over-interpretation, again, that often accompanies um, magisterial engagements with lived experience. The, the leaders and the, the committees tasked with compiling these documents exercised in ways that I, I know for a fact, because I know some of the people that participated in this process, in ways that often felt very difficult. They, they exercised a very different kind of power. Um, in a process like uh, this sort of synthesizing action, power is, is enacted really consequentially and perhaps most consequentially in the process of interpretation, right? Anybody can talk, anybody can listen. And I mean, on one level, that talking and listening is, is very powerful, right? Advocates of the synodal process are quick to point out rightly that being a synodal church is about the journey, right? It's about journeying together, not the, the destination. It's about the process, not the product. It's about practices, not outcomes. And yet, right, outcomes matter too. And, and, they, out, and they matter very deeply because they serve uh, as a referendum on the process and on the integrity of the process. Um, in this sense, uh, at a really definitive level, um, power is is exercised by those with the authority to record or not, to synthesize or sublimate, to interpret or impose an interpretation, to report, to decide. Uh, and we shouldn't be naive about that kind of power. Uh, the second phase of the synod, which is sort of now beginning, will be profoundly consequential in this respect. And I think we do well to pay close attention to who exercises this hermeneutical power, this interpretive power, and how they do that as the, as the synod continues to unfold. The second point um, that I want to make um, is about uh, global listening as, as a process of, of communion and solidarity. Um, the calls for women's leadership in the church, ordained or otherwise, are, are frequently miscast as this sort of myopic concern of the West, right? As like an American concern. Often, and often the global nature of the church is cited, right, as reason enough to sort of downplay the urgency of conversations like that. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, the role of women may be a concern to Catholics in the United States, um, but this simply isn't what Catholics in Asia or South America are talking about. But as it turns out, and as the DCS tells us very forthrightly, the status of women in the church is very much what Catholics in Asia or South America are talking about. Um, almost all of the DCS stated, almost all reports and they had the national, the 200 national reports, almost all reports raise the issue of full and equal participation of women. The six paragraphs on women within the DCS weave together voices in, in quotes from three continents, as well as the Union of Superiors General and the International Union of Superiors, uh, of, uh, Superiors General. Uh, a, a synodal church, Pope Francis often reminds us, is a listening church. And the synod working documents reveal that a listening church is also a church in solidarity. Uh, like I said, I was really surprised at how emotional I felt when I first read uh, the DCS after it was released in October. Uh, and as somebody suspicious of grand unifying theological categories, the experience of attending to the symphony of voices and perspectives reflected in both the national and global reports was really the closest thing to communion I've felt in, in quite a long time. It was very powerful in some way to behold the voices filtered through committee, of course, several times over, um, but still in some way to behold a sense of the voices of our sisters in Asia, in South America, in Africa, even across the United States, right? This is a profoundly divided country. 
um, politically, but also regionally, geographically, um, and to simply have the opportunity to sit with the perspectives of folks um, who don't live near me, right? Who don't live in places that I've been, who live in places that that I haven't ever really thought about. Um, and I'm talking here in the US, um, places that perhaps I've stereotyped in the past. Um, that was profoundly holy for me. Um, and I, I've become aware of the experiences of others for whom that has also been a, a profoundly holy and humbling experience. So how might this exercise in synodal listening shift our ecclesial imaginations? We're all familiar with the Vatican II ecclesiology of the people of God, right? Yet rarely do we have a global experience of this peoplehood. To encounter the voices of women from across the globe, from every continent, raised not in unison, right, but in sort of a glorious polyphony, uh, is in a real way to have an experience of our own peoplehood before God and one another. The synod will be a, a success, to use a superficial term, um, I think if it can propel women toward local and global solidarity with one another. We're not alone. We're not outliers. We're not supporting characters. We are, to use the language of the synod, protagonists of the church in every sense. I want to say uh, a word in conclusion before I turn it over to Kayla. Um, and that is uh, a note about uh, the, the entity in the national uh, synthesis um, called Region 16. Um, when we look back on the Synod, I think there will be a very powerful story to be written about the work of so-called Region 16. Region 16, there are 15 uh, geographical uh, regions in the United States. The, the U.S. is divided into regions based on groupings of archdioceses that are, or dioceses and archdioceses that are, are close to each other, proximity to one another. And there are 15 of those. If you, you can pull up the map on the USCCB website. Um, but there was, uh, in the Synod, for the purpose of the Synod, they created what was called Region 16, um, which was a non-geographical region created by the U.S. Synod team to solicit the contributions of Catholic organizations and groups that are outside of the traditional diocesan structure. Um, they received 112 reports from Region 16, so-called, including uh, the LCWR, the Leadership Conference of, of uh, Women Religious, Catholic Health Association, National Catholic Office of the Deaf, educational institutions, colleges, universities, campus ministries, Catholic Relief Services, Catholic Labor Network, New Ways Ministry, Catholic Climate Covenant, Pax Christi, uh, Discerning Deacons, and, and many, many more, dozens more. And in the synthesis document for Region 16, we see some of the most prophetic and clear-eyed and detailed calls for women's participation in leadership in the church. When I read this report and, and talked to friends and colleagues who participated in the Region 16 consultation, for me, I have a profound recognition of the movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the prophetic participation of this, this collective known as Region 16 in the Synod, I think also raises very crucial questions about geography and place and belonging in the future of the church. And in some ways, perhaps it suggests certain limits of the present parish structure to foster the integral and robust promotion of women in the church. And I, this is somebody who studies parishes and believes deeply in parishes. Um, but uh, there's something about being adjacent to that structure, right, within the communion of the church, but adjacent to certain uh, somewhat calcified structures that I think enables people to listen in a different way to the movings of the spirit. And I think we would do very well to pay attention to the, fo the, the, the folks, the voices who, who exist on those prophetic edges. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, I wanna return as a way of closing to the, uh, to the story with which I began. The year after I was reassigned to the role of Peter, in my parish's silent passion performance, I was walking with the community in the neighborhood Way of the Cross on Good Friday, which journeyed through the neighborhood of Eggleston Square in Roxbury, where this parish was located. Um, in that ritual, rather than one person portraying Jesus, participants took turn carrying the cross, 
uh, trading it off at each station. And at one point I was given the cross to carry through the streets. And much later I was struck by the contrast between the passion mime during mass and the via crucis in the streets of Roxbury. In some ways, both were highly contextualized portrayals of the passion. Both were lay directed and performed. But only in one of those spaces could anyone, a woman, a mother, a child, a gay man, a teenager, stand in persona Christi, right, in the person of Christ. The streets, it seemed, offered transgressive possibilities that the chance to imagine who were all those social theorists, I wondered, all those historians who had sort of long ago decided that the private realm was women's domain. In the streets, I found, it was in the streets that a woman could be Jesus. And I'll leave it there and turn it over to Kayla. Well, that was a powerful ending. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. All right. Give me one second here. So I am excited to introduce um, LIMS alum responder. We have uh, Miss Kayla August. She is a student at the School of Theology and Ministry at Boston College, where she's pursuing a PhD in theology and education with a focus on preaching. She has preached in a variety of places, including McGrath Institute for Church Life, Saturday with the Saints at Notre Dame, and the St. Francis of Assisi Parish in New York's Seven Last Words of Christ prayer service on Good Friday. Her interest in formation is rooted in her experience as a university ministry intern at Loyola University of New Orleans, as well as her professional work as the Assistant Director of Evangelization in the University of Notre Dame's Campus Ministry Department and as the Rector of Lions Hall. She desires to use preaching to impact religious education by inspiring Catholics to deepen their encounters with scripture, tradition, and how God plays an active role in our daily lives. She hopes through preaching to enliven the youth and young adult Catholic communities and inspire marginalized voices like her own in the Catholic faith and to play an active role in the church. So welcome. We are so grateful you are here with us this evening, Kayla, and we will let you take it away. And everybody else, remember, you can put questions in the chat and we'll have time for Q&A in the end. Go ahead, Kayla. Thank you so much, Tracy. And, and thank you, Susan. I, we come from the same institution at BC. Obviously, Susan is doing wonderful, great things, but I didn't get the chance to learn beside her since she came before me. So being in this moment and getting to learn from you now, Susan, and to listen to you has been such a gift. So thank you. Um, and, and I don't know what's next for the church, as you kind of mentioned, as we go into this little process, it's a really open process of letting the spirit move. But as I was thinking about my views and, and things that I think about when it comes to this little process as a woman, um, I think, how do we act now? What can we do now? And I'm going to start by my, my reflections by starting how Jesus did with a story. So last summer, I had the privilege of traveling to Israel with the Notre Dame Folk Choir. It was such a gift. Um, and like Susan, we got the chance to walk through the streets as the Stations of the Cross and in remembrance of Jesus, feeling the cobblestone of the places where his hands and feet had touched. And we also visited the Holy Sepulcher where we believe that his body was buried before resurrection. We visited the town of Magdala and the home, the home of Mary Magdalene. And we even held mass in the upper room because that's a really nerdy Catholic moment for me, but mass in the upper room was so exciting. Um, Upper Rome is where the apostles gathered for the Eucharist and, and also where it was believed that they were sent out on Pentecost. In this room where church as we know it began, I had the unique honor of guest preaching at the service. And it was a group of young adults during this mass that were listening. After mass, one young woman in particular came up to me with tears in her eyes. And in this moment, this seemingly small and significant moment, had left a mark on her. And she said, I've never seen a woman do that before. I've never seen that. And thank you so much. It meant so much to me. As a woman who preaches whenever and wherever I can, I was reminded of just how powerful it can be to hear a voice that often goes unheard, witness in a new way. It wells up emotion inside of us. And particularly when the voice reflects our own. This is what it felt like for me to read the words in this synthesis document, to hear the voices of those across America and the world speaking of the church they hope to see. 
as a black woman, this moment of synodality in the church is not simply a way to think about women, but for me, all the marginalized voices who stand gleaming in persona Christe without our notice, right before our eyes every day. Synod is an ancient word in the tradition of the church. It's composed of the Greek words meaning with and path. And synodality on this kind of combination of with and path means a path we walk together. So this walking together that we keep saying is a part of the word that makes up synod. And it means that we are sharing our gifts, our values, we're being seen and heard together on this path. And Pope Francis notes that synodality is the path God expects of the church. God expects our synodality. And he notes that we don't only act out synodality. It's not something we perform. It's a part of who we are innately. Synodality is a spirit of how we live as a church rather than simply a point in time for our church. That means it's who we are. It's how we interact. It's how we gather. It's what guides our past and sees us into a new future that God has for us. So at Pentecost, when that spirit filled the room, and descended like tongues of fire on the disciples, they preached to all those gathered from every nation in their own native tongue. But a powerful moment of preaching is something we can also do. And I believe we as a church are called to preach in our actions and in our words still today. But before we speak, before we actually proclaim, we must listen. Now, as someone who studies preaching, what I think is interesting is both preaching and synodality begin in the same place by what we hear. We have to first listen to the people before we ever make a statement to the people. And the voices of the people of God help us to know what to say. They help us hear the spirit. These voices appear and print throughout the synthesis of the documents. If you get the chance to read them, I really highly, I hope you will. And these documents findings show a people of God that speak. They speak of the desire for new forms of leadership for women, religious and lay women. They speak of the end to sexist language and sexist decision-making of exclusion of women religious from meaningful roles. These synthesis documents speak of the concerns about racism that people of color experience both inside and outside the church. They speak about the desire to find new ways to accompany with authenticity LGBTQ Catholics and persons and their families who are part of this church and want to find ways to really feel like they are home. They speak of those sharing a deep ache in the wake of the departure of young adults who are disaffiliating and leaving in large amounts. And they speak about these young adults who want to hear the church speak about issues that matter to them, be it race or justice or climate change. The people of God spoke about us acting on behalf of those on the margins, those who lack social and economic power, such as immigrant communities or ethnic minorities or those who are undocumented, people who are experiencing poverty or homelessness or incarceration, those people who have disabilities or have mental health issues, people suffering from various addictions, all of those that need us. They spoke about what we were doing about those people who are a part of this body of Christ. But overall, something that struck me is the most common desire named in these synodal consultations, the primary one, was to be a more welcoming church a more welcoming church where all members of the people of God can find accompaniment on the journey. It seems so simple, but what does it truly mean to not just sing the words at mass, but to truly say that and live that all are welcome in this place? I think the Sonoda moment can help us. It can help us to become the people of God we aim to be, not just to preach welcome, but to create space for those who want to be welcome. So synodality is not just a moment in time, but a way of being church. Listening isn't just something we do in a session, right? It's how we interact with one another inside and outside the church's walls. So that we don't just remain on a balcony preaching to those in earshot, but we encounter the spirit at work as we live among each other every day. Listening. Listening is a seemingly simple, but difficult beginning. Lisa Thompson, a preacher and theologian at Vanderbilt, she says that listening is a cultural act. Listening is a cultural act. Listening is something we unconsciously do in different ways and in different times and spaces, depending on where we are. 
It becomes a habit of whom we listen to and whom we don't. A muscle memory, as Susan puts it, of the voices that call us to attention. The voices that make us listen are those that continually go overlooked or dismissed. So if we want to change the culture, if we must find a new way to be in culture with each other, then the Catholic Church has to change the context in which we hear. If we only listen during noted sacramental moments or during the homily, how many voices do we miss in our church? I think these documents show us just how many are missed when those are the only times that our ears cue in. Outside the church, we live in a culture filled with a lot of noise, but little listening. We are bombarded with social media and streaming television and continuous news feeds that usually have a lot of negativity thrown upon them. And inside the church, we encounter a different type of noise. Sometimes that noise can be racism experienced or clericalism or sexism that seeps into the seemingly small decisions that make a significant impact. Even at a micro level, they have a macro level impact on the community. We have been culturally conditioned to hear certain voices and to drown out others. And we see that in children's voices that went unheard in the sex abuse crisis. We see that in families crying out at the border and in war-torn countries as we flip the channel. We see that in LGBT, LGBTQ voices that call out to be told that they are beloved and to really see that. We see that in racist acts within our country that we see on the news but that are rarely lifted up in prayers at our parishes. We see that as sexism penetrates not only the offices of our community in office spaces and in um, firms, but also even in our parish council. We see that in the document as it calls us to act against a sense of the status quo that not only undermines women, but undermines our shared mission of a church. Guys, these are important things. And as we look for this cultural conversion of church to happen post-Synod, it starts with the cultural acts that we practice today. It doesn't just happen in an instant, no matter what the outcome is. As we work toward leadership and structural changes, we must also work toward spiritual ones, changing our hearts and the habits of exclusion that we've gotten used to muscle memory that we've practiced without even realizing it. The Internal Theological Commission notes that Synod dialogue depends on the courage to speak and the courage to truly listen. Synodal dialogue depends on the courage to speak and the courage to truly listen. Guys, that means that we must be willing to hear the joys and the wounds of the living body. Those wounds are important. They, they show us where we're aching and what needs to be known. Because the synod notes that attentive listening is the catalyst of true discernment. And at moments, we must be vulnerable enough to admit the spaces when our lack of listening continued the status quo. Listening is how we truly hear the Holy Spirit move for the renewal of church. And because the church is not simply an institution, the church is a people. We can start today. I really believe that by listening in a synodal way to the people nearest to us. Listening puts us in relationship with those in the pew beside us so that the church isn't just something we attend, but it's something that we are. We live it out in ways when we pray and interact and aid each other. We live it out in moments when we share our joys and our continued work for justice. We live it as we preach in the example of Jesus who came to change the world, but we do so by first changing ourselves. How do we do this? We do this in a synodal way on a local level that then leads to global impact. We start at our home church. We start by interacting with those we encounter every single day, hearing them and letting that hearing bring us to action. Susan's right that these synodal documents must lead to some form of change or action, but action and change is a multi-layered reality. The synodal movement is a Pentecostal one because we come together and speak and we will be sent out to live church in a new way. We don't just stay in the upper room. It's not how we make a home in the upper room. We, we work to build a house where many rooms and everyone finds a place to call their own. I was listening to a podcast recently by, with Trevor Noah on it. Trevor Noah, as you know, is a comedian and talk show host. Um, he is 
mostly known for saying funny things, but he said something really, really insightful. He spoke about how we live within structures and how we manifest new futures within them. And he said, a space is always created by someone and that someone who creates the space will generally create it with themselves in mind. That if we build a house, he said, the natural way for someone to build that house is if I built the house for say, I would build a house with different floors and with stairs to get me from one floor to the next. But it's only when I encounter someone with a disability that I realize that they can't use those stairs. And I built this house for me without the consideration of that other element that allows others to come and enjoy and be in this house too. So when I think of that, I think what hope do we have and what church do we want to build? If this is truly God's house, what house do we want it to be? In John 14 too, Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? For many women and other marginalized voices, they're asking, is there a place for us? So I ask, how does listening today change the way we build the church of tomorrow? How might listening change the way we preach in the church and by our witness? How might listening be the new way to hear the spirit at work in previously unheard arenas that offer a fuller voice of God that we can hear as a united community? One that helps us work together and build the church that we can all call home so that the room where we begin becomes the place where we are sent forth and that we are not sent forth alone but that we truly leave and walk together as one. Amen. Thank you so much, Kayla and Susan. This was just phenomenal. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Hang on. Phenomenal. I wanted to add, not replace. Um, phenomenal. I, I just, I, I was taking copious notes for both of you because it was just um truly insightful. And I just saw this underlying thread between you both about, um, you know, that notion of muscle memory. And I just, it really just struck me the way you both spoke about how exclusion becomes muscle memory. I have gotten into my older age, starting to come back to playing piano and I'm taking lessons. And it's so, you know, just thinking of that, you know, when I mess up and I continually mess up, I've created the wrong muscle memory for what I'm playing. And, and so it's just, it's so real to think of it that way, you know, and, and I just, so I really appreciate the insight, all of your wisdom that you've shared with us tonight. We have a few questions that are coming through the chat and folks fill them in. We might not have time for all of them, but I'll, we're going to do our best. Um, the first one that came in is a reflection from a woman named Linda who said in our diocese, archdiocese there hasn't been a great deal of emphasis on the synod um and there hasn't been much follow-up with the continental stage and i would i would say linda that's been a common experience i've heard from a lot of folks unfortunately um in our area she says there's a push towards a return to the use of latin restricting altar servers lectors to males only women are encouraged to bake cookies and iron linens it's very frustrating is there any way for us to try to be bold and heard? Many of my friends are just leaving and attending mass online and programs like this. What, what recommendations would you have for folks like Linda? Gosh, yeah. I feel like Linda, in few words, you've put your finger on an experience that is so deeply um, saturated and increasingly so within uh the church in the U.S. particularly, and I mean, it's throughout different dioceses, but particularly in, in certain geographical regions, um, the strong sort of pendular reactionary push against what was perceived um, as, you know, the, the excesses of Vatican II, uh, so-called. And um, it, it's been within that pushback milieu that um, the priests and the seminary, the seminarians who are now entering uh, the priesthood have been sort of formed, uh, right? It was, I mean, I'm thinking about these are people who are in my generation and, um, you know, you had uh, John Paul II, you know, really kind of um, uh, uh, orienting folks through the publishing of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and through other things, um, uh, toward this very apologetics focused um, understanding of the theological task of the ecclesial task um, as though the best thing that we can possibly do is like 
defend our faith against imagined others. Um, and that manifests in a church that's very, very concerned uh, about its its borders um, and uh, not very concerned and in fact, very averse um, to any porosity that might appear to exist within those borders. Um, and this sort of circling of the wagons is something that is just profoundly disheartening. Um, as far as advice goes, um, I mean, I think that um, when I think about, for example, that Region 16 report, um, that that feels very vivifying and inspiring to me. I know um, the woman, Casey Stanton, who um, established the group Discerning Deacons. We were, we were college classmates at Notre Dame and, um, and have continued to, um, to grow in, in friendship. And I admire her so much, um, because she's an incredible organizer. Um, she went to, um, to seminary, um, among the Protestants <laughs> as well, not at, um, not at, at, uh, Candler, um, but at another institution, but that at, she went to Duke. Um, and that means that she took, preaching um, and gained a sense of her own voice as a woman in the church. And she's a deeply faith-filled Catholic and mother of two beautiful children um, and professional. Um, and that faith for her is manifested in this really incredible work that she's leading in the group Discerning Deacons. And so I, I mentioned that to say that that's, I see folks who that I, I see that as a practice of, of deciding that no matter what it, it means, I am going to belong because we are the church, right? The church isn't, as I, I saw another con uh, um, comment note, right? The church, the church is an institution, right? And I think we actually need to think a lot more critically about institutions theologically. Usually we're like institution, like bad, but like church, like people, like good. No, the inst institutions are also good, right? Um, institutions are guardians of traditions, um, which are what, and at the end, you know, just like the, the communal story uh, of a people. Um, institutions are important. Institutions have a, a very important role, but the church, of course, is fundamentally, and Lumen Gentium tells us in its organization, right, in uh, chapter two of Lumen Gentium after the introduction is the people of God. And only then after chapter three discuss, uh, discusses the hierarchical composition of the church. So preeminently, primordially, the church is the people of God. Um, and I think finding those spaces to belong, even if they're virtual spaces, and it, it's, it's both a gift, but also a pain. I think that often the only spaces people can find um, to, to satiate their souls, um, our, our virtual spaces, but finding those, those spaces, um, is that's an act of salvation for yourself, right? Not only saving your sanity, I think, but also, you know, saving your, your, um, in a sense, ma say, maintaining the right to have a place safe for you in the church. So it was kind of a long and rambly, like non-answer. Um, but I think I, I continue to be inspired by that region 16 work. Caleb probably has more, like, more succinct and concrete things to say about that question. Susan, I think you, you said so many good things. Um, also, I'm a big fan of Casey Stanton. So uh, <laughs> thank you for bringing her up. <laughs> Who isn't? Um, I, I think as I hear this, I I just want to validate frustration because I think sometimes it's so quickly to move to like, let's make a new plan or be happy. And it's like, it's okay to sit in heartache. It's okay to sit in pain. I think that's what it is to, to really be listening. And that's what I think the documents are so powerful to me because it's saying that they're listening. They're listening to people's lived experience. Um, also, I think the thing that I have grown as I continue to live in church and that gives me hope um, is that the church is not a monolith, just like women are a monolith, right? Different spaces and parishes and experiences, depending on where I grow and where I've lived, has have been so different. And um, and they've all still been Catholic, this beautiful universal church that even in these very different spaces, we are one and we are united in Christ has been something that gave me a lot of hope. So, and sometimes we're in that community that say, like, I just don't jive with you guys and how I feel that, that you feel like the spirit might be moving in this very particular way. Um, but then sometimes down the street, you're like, this is completely different. It's this, and it's the same beautiful Catholic church. Um, so uh, maybe it's an online thing that you're searching for now, but 
I would say, remembering the church is wide, is there another space that maybe, again, another beautiful Catholic space that might you might find home at or ask that person? And then I would also say, something that stuck out to me when I was reading these documents is that you know, you think about this nodal process and people might not even know what it is as we're coming into it. But the document said that the people who participated um, initially met were met with skepticism and suspicion. So they, they initially came in and they were like, OK, what is this? What's this going to be? And I I love that because it's so easy to be like wide eyed and excited. But they were like, are you really going to listen? What's going to happen with this? And yet they came in and they said that they experienced transformation in the process of just listening to each other and hearing each other's stories and hearing what church could be and what church has been. So that there is an, even in our reluctancy sometimes to enter into a space, when we actually take that step, we realize that we and others are transformed. So I think I, while you were searching, I'm not, not an easy path, um, even in a, being a missionary church, sometimes we're missionaries just finding the church that we want to be at. I would ask you, what would be the power of possibly, even when we skeptically walk in, to be someone who takes on something new and says, maybe this could be the space where I am transformed or I work to transform the space because the spirit is in you too. Thank you both. We're kind of at time, but I wonder if I could just throw in like a combination of some of the questions and comments that I saw, kind of Lisa and Sue and others. And I think you all named it well. There's a lot of great frustration around um, the role of women and those that are marginalized in the church that they don't feel space to be heard or to be welcomed. Um, so I just wonder um, if you maybe could speak, if you just have time, um, for one last kind of thought, kind of combining these two, um, and I and Sue's naming you know, women are being removed from ministries, basically, and, and men are being put in their place. And, um, you know, I realized myself growing up, I was an altar server, and I didn't think twice about it. And that was in the 80s, you know, and I came here to New Orleans, and I found out that there are churches here that do not let women, girls be altar servers. And I thought, what was I doing in the 80s that, you know, sorry, I just dated myself, but, you know, so like, so I see that too, Sue, I want to affirm what you're saying, I see it here too. And so, and that, and then also the, you know, not using inclusive language. Can you speak to how removing women from these very key ministries they've been serving in the church, um, in light of the fact that the Pope just changed canon law to include women as <laughs> installed ministry of the catechist, lector, and acolyte? So that just changed because it used to just be men. Um, so in light of that, like, what does it do to us as the people of God? Maybe I can kind of reframe it as that when we've decided that we're not going to use inclusive language and we're going to prevent women from being in roles that they should be allowed to be in is the way the church is structured today. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Gloria and Saldua, who writes in her um, 1987 book, the, she's a, a late Chicana theorist and poet and writer um, and proud queer woman um, writing out of the border, U.S.-Mexico border space. Um, uh, in her first book, uh, Borderlands, um, she, she writes, nothing occurs um, in practice, or maybe she says nothing occurs in, in real life unless it first occurs to us in our imagination. And um, when we think about how our ecclesial imaginations, our imaginations about what it means to be church, how our theological imaginations, um, how our spiritual imaginations are formed, right? They're formed by our participation very often in in church, in church communities. They're formed by our encounters um, with other people of faith. They're formed by our encounters um, with texts. Um, they're, in, they're informed by, by songs, um, right? And so much of it is like osmotic, right? It just sort of sinks in um, beneath the level of our consciousness until all of a sudden we realize um, that, oh, you know, you're right. When I think of God, I do picture a white bearded man and hmm, nobody gave me that image, but it came to me, right? Over decades and decades of being sort of enculturated into this, this, um, this, the, the culture of the church that, that, you know, in, in ways both explicit and impl implicit forms our imagination about God, about church, about ourselves, about others. Um, I, when, when the pandemic, um, First started and churches were closed. Um, we tried to watch mass on online and our kids were like very, very small at that point. Um, they were like toddlers and, um, and, and a 
pre pre K or was the oldest. Um, and they're like, why are we doing this? Like, let's just play church. Um, and I was like, what? Like, okay. Um, and they, of course, being like Montessori kids, they got the candlesticks down from the all, the um, mantle and like a cross off the wall and like a, their like children's storybook Bible and like a per, it was lent, like a, like a purple linen from the closet, you know, and like set up a little altar on their craft table and then like did a little procession around the house. And that was remarkable to me. And I tell this story in service of the last point. Um, because number one, they are, were, and continue to be just horrible during church. I, I'm like, why are we even making the effort half the time? Um, like they spent more time in the narthex, I think, than they have in the actual sanctuary. Um, so that was a shock. Uh, first of all, I'm like, oh, look at that. You've been paying attention. Um, but wait, they were like small. I mean, they were like three, five years old, four years old at the time. Um, and somehow, they had soaked in enough of what it meant to be church and to do church that the minute was like, we can't go to church. What can we do? They're like, oh, well, we have this muscle memory, right? Um, we can, we kind of get it too, um, in ways that they had never articulated, right? In words. Um, and so that's just for me, I think about that whenever I think about, you know, how we're formed by church um, at such a young age. Right. Um, I remember once too, I was, I was on my way to a panel. I had to like travel to New York and my, my kids were like, where are you going? And I'm like, I'm going to be on a, a, going on a panel, whatever. And they're like, what does that mean? And I was like, it's when people who are experts in different things sit around and talk about different questions. And my middle daughter, Lucy goes, what are you an expert in? And I go, believe it or not, I'm an expert on the church. And she goes, no, you're not. (laughs) And I'm like, that's fair. And then she goes, oh, priests are experts on the church. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And then, okay, first of all, I failed as a per- like as a parent, as a theologian. Like, I've cool. That's great. And second, like again, I'm her mom. Like, this is, and she's like, I thought only priests were experts in that. We go to this Jesuit parish where like lay people preach all the time. It's like this, you know. It's, I mean, it's it's not like you know deeply progressive space, but it's still like it's a it's a great parish. Um, and they've seen me preach. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, this is a kid who I am raising and she still instinctively, right. It's like, well, I thought, oh, I thought only the priests are, are experts on the church. Um, and it just shows you the power of those subtle cues. And and there are also non-subtle cues, right? Like the fact that priests are men. Um, but even the subtle, the language, right. The gender exclusionary language, who they see as an altar server, all of these little moments, um, are forming us all the time. And they form us about who we believe God is. They form us about who we believe the church is, who we, we are in relationship to the church. They form us about who we think we are um, and who we're allowed to be and who God sees us as and whether or not God likes us um, and, or thinks it's better to be a man than a woman, right? All things that cerebrally we're like, no, but we feel things deeper than we think them, right? Um And so, again, this was just a very long way um, of not so much answering as affirming the question. Um, I do think it's important. I think all of those things, those little decisions, it all matters, right? It all matters. Um, And unfortunately, those are the same spaces that people get on high horses about, oh, like this is all of these kind of outward markers are like become these silly sites of culture war battles. But at the end of the day, that's a distraction, right? It really is a distraction. These things matter and they matter so much. And they don't just matter because they make us feel better or make us feel more included. They matter because we're trying to, in the words of Herbert McCabe, trying to, to say fewer dumb things about God right? At, at all, that's all theology is. It's just this ongoing quest to, to speak less poorly <laughs> and ever so slightly more adequately about God. Um, and I think that any opportunity that we have to do that uh, is an opportunity that we're obligated to take. Thank you, Susan. Um, honestly, when you, you asked that question, the first thing that came to my mind is something that I, I'm still sitting with because it hit me so hard when I read it. It's Mary Daly, I believe, a feminist Mary Daly. And she wrote, um, if God is man, then man is God. Mm. And that's it. And I remember thinking, ooh. And how in the ways that when we use this particular language for God that um, 
that we do kind of structure who who can be seen as kind of above others in the same realm, right? That men become um, on this pedestal that is, as your daughter could have noticed, they have the knowledge. This is where the knowledge comes from often. I think for me, it it was a reminder of when I'm using my language about God that I do use it openly um, and that I, I don't always use it in the he. I, it seems like such a simple thing, but just last week I'm in a preaching class and there's um, people from all different traditions there. And there was a young man from the Jewish tradition who preached and he talked about God as she. It was like, it wasn't like a, he was making a statement. He was just like doing his sermon and he was just mentioning God and he was like, and she said this. And I remember in that moment being like, like I was like caught off guard. I was like, oh, okay. Cause I've never heard anybody kind of do it unless they're like making a statement. He was just doing it. Mm -hmm. And I remember also being so moved about how I saw, like I sunk into the sermon differently. I was listening in a way that was new. I, I, I heard the piece of the sermon and it hit my heart in a different way of saying it's, it's not that, um, he was talking about God in the way that was like crazy different. It was just that like, I was able to see the God in me differently because of how he spoke about it. And so I think that is the beauty of that, that language of broadening our language in that. And I think it starts in other ways for me, when I am um, preaching in different contexts, I, I make sure to look for the story um, of women in the gospel passages so I can bring it out. So we can be like, cause sometimes those stories go overlooked. Often if we're reading in a Catholic context, we have a long passage at the gospel and we have two versions and, you know, we're Catholic. We need to get out, we're going to get in and get out in our hour. So we usually choose the shorter passage. I'm used to that too. Um, but the longer passage usually has something really good on it. Um, one example is Simeon. Um, Simeon who sees Jesus when he's coming in um, to for the official Jewish ceremony as a baby. And Simeon takes Jesus and it's like, now I can die because I, I have witnessed the salvation, right? And then we end there, we cut it off. What's after that? Anna. The prophetess Anna, who also sees Jesus and goes in, out and witnesses and preaches to the world about what she has seen and how Jesus has come to save us. So even in the way that we read the Bible and the, what we proclaim to say, let's not leave these moments out because these moments tell us about the story of the full church and about all of us in the church and about how we can live in light of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you both so very much for this evening. It was very powerful and very rich. I apologize. We can't, we had actually a lot more comments than questions. So I think a lot of comments, comments. <laughs> of affirmation and frustration. And, you know, I think we share a lot of that together. So um, I just want to thank you both again, Susan and Kayla, for being with us this evening. This was a very powerful session on the role of women in a synodal church. And I'm so grateful that you were able to share your wisdom and your experience with us. I want to let everybody know that our next lecture in our series on becoming a listening church, the invitation to synodality is on April 20th. Mark your calendars at same time, same bat channel, um, 7 p.m. Central, with LIM's very own Dr. Emily Jensik, who will be speaking on the role of young adults in a synodal church, followed by our young adult alumni, uh, Ms. Marissa Alvarez, who will offer a response to her talk based on her research context and experience. And I just want, you know, if there's anything that you heard today that you thought this is fantastic, I really like these folks, then, you know, consider <laughs> studying with Lim because we tackle these topics every day in our courses. And we have graduate programs and undergraduate programs that are fully online. And so I'm going to drop a few links in the chat here about our programs. And if you did not get a chance to sign up for all the lectures in the series, then please sign up right there in that last little box in the bottom. So thank you all for joining us this evening evening. It was so good to see some alums in the, in the participant side and some current students and, and new friends of LIM. And so I encourage you to follow us all on Facebook to see what other wonderful things we might come up with next. <laughs> so thank you, Susan and Kayla. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thanks, everyone. This was a privilege. Thank you. Sarah, good to see you. <laughs>